The regular season may be 82 games long, but the NBA dominates the conversation 365 days a year. The league has reached peak popularity, a cultural phenomenon. At any given moment, another scene is being written in sports' most fascinating show. Whether you follow NBA Twitter or keep up with King James, we all want to know how the players live, what they wear, and how they do what they do every single night. And the league has a wealth of superstars who can't wait to feed the public's desire. We've gathered some of the NBA's most outspoken and respected vets to discuss how the NBA grew to become more than a game and much larger than life. This is Complex Conversations, how the NBA turned into a 365-day empire with your host, Rachel Nichols. All right, this panel is about how the NBA became a 365 sport. If there were more days in the calendar, it would take up more days because that's just how bursting it is at the moment. And I want to ask these guys, because it's changed in the time since you started playing to now being in the league. When do you think, Paul, was the first time you really realized, hmm, this is year round? Was there a point where people were bothering you more? Was it when Kevin Durant left Oklahoma City to go to Golden State and the whole summer went on fire? What was the thing for you? I think it all, like for me, it started like when Twitter first came out. And I, and I don't know what year it was, uh, maybe like 2006, Late 2000s, yeah. seven. Um, you know, I, I was one of the original players, I think, on it. I was introduced to it really in the early stages. And, uh, you know, I started Twitter. And the first tweet I did was, I said, uh, and I didn't know if this would work. I said, I got tickets, you know, for the first five people who show up at the garden, meet me there at 3.30. So I was like, all right, whatever, I pull up to the garden. It's like a hundred people outside. I'm like, oh shit. I mean, you know, oh. So I like, it's complex, I like, John. You can swear. I like roll my windows down and just threw the tickets out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, damn, this is crazy. Like, really, people responded to this, mm-hmm. you know, because I didn't really know too much about. It. Just was getting the platform was just getting started, and I was just like, wow. And so, you know, all summer. You know, you tweet stuff like, meet me here, meet me there. You just saw how far your voice reached, and it was just like, man. I could really just tell the story right here sitting on my couch. Yeah. Was there a point for you, Richard? (laughs) Well, I was on uh, I was on the Milwaukee Bucks team when Charlie Villanueva tweeted. So Charlie Villanueva, people that don't know, Charlie Villanueva at halftime tweeted, rough first half, gotta gotta step it up. You know, coach got on me, goes out, has a great second half. I think it might have been against the Lakers, uh, but (laughs) uh, but pretty much it blew up everywhere because they were like Yo, there's a dude tweeting at halftime or, or putting out messages at halftime. And then the NBA started coming up with rules. And that was the first time people were like, yo, he tweeted. People were like, what is Twitter? Right? I don't think it had really gone everywhere. But then that's when people were like, okay, the NBA is implementing rules about when you can talk on social media 30 minutes before, 30 minutes afterwards. And, you know, once the NBA starts implementing rules, you know, things start to change. Yeah, well, uh, they change, but they, they still, you guys still find ways around them, which <laughs> yeah, gets me to my Joel next two guys and, on this and, panel. And, and, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Matt, what about for you? Mine was, uh, unfortunately, when I was with my ex-wife on reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> no bullshit. Uh, Shit was horrible. <laughs> but then also playing in the NBA, you yeah. know what I mean? So really seeing those two worlds collide and... Not saying that I I wasn't a fan of the show, but it opened me up to a whole new audience. You know what I mean? So now from there on out, like more of my stuff was more TMZ and ESPN type stuff. So it was really just a crazy situation, understanding like being open up to a whole new world, that reality world. And and to me, what the NBA is now is probably like the best reality TV show on on TV. It's, It's year round. You know what I mean? So that's when I like 2010, 2011 was really when it kind of started. And Gil, you reminded me, I said, oh, what if you had been on social media, Gil, like when all that crazy stuff happened in D.C. with the guns? And he looked at me and goes, oh, I was. (laughs) (laughs) I blocked that out, clearly, because it was traumatic for me. But can you explain how, especially during a lockout, right? So this is during the summer, during a lockout, when the NBA season is not supposed to happen, you still had a voice, right? Yeah, see, I started before these guys. See, I was part of the, um, the NBA blog that started in 2005. So I was already ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but you know, everybody I, shouldn't have a voice. Like, let's just... <laughs> let's just, let's just <laughs> we went to college together, so he knows, say, he knows the worst there, of me. There's good and bad to everyone having a voice, but continue. If you wanted to know what it was like on the team bus at Arizona when Gil and Richard both played there, this panel is going to tell <laughs> you. So continue. <laughs> so I was, I was part of the, the, the NBA.com blog, so everyone was hearing my voice every week. So... I end up winning blog of the year twice. 
So right when Twitter came out, you was on fire already. The yeah, yeah, yeah. was cooking. So I I just got in trouble. <coughs> so what ends Again. up happening is, while the media is attacking me, I'm firing back. Right. So I'm I'm going back and forth. So I'm getting fined. <laughs> so I'm I'm getting fined at the same time, and I, I'll I'll let everyone know now. I never got suspended for guns. I got suspended uh, detrimental to the team because I wouldn't stop. What were so you, there, what was the what for was having guns? It wasn't for having Come on. guns. Come no, that's no, detrimental no. to the team. No, 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 no. And, and because almost, I came out doing this <laughs> as my pregame, and it's almost it, it was that out, was it's <laughs> almost as if somebody went into your locker room a couple weeks before, pleaded with you, and was like, Gilbert, you got to stop cracking jokes about this. He's like, but that's what I do. I'm like. They're going to make an example out of you if you don't stop. You did say that. I did. I did. I did. I did. But I don't, I, don't, I don't listen to him. No, no. I mean, let's be honest. Like, I was the best player on our team. And so why would and, I listen to him? And the lowest draft pick on our team. Yes. And the lowest draft pick from our team. So, That's not due to talent. That was, that was doing because I was, was an due idiot. to guns. And when was, was there a time where you realized, huh, I can use this platform. I can have control. I can have the microphone. We don't have to wait for people like Rachel to like write this down in a newspaper, what we're going to say. Was there a point, Matt, where you realized that? I think that's really been the biggest blessing for me post-career because I think, you know, my reputation kind of preceded itself. So I was a thug. I was a bad guy. I was this. I was that. My teammates knew I wasn't like that, but the world got two hours of me on this and saw me on a crazy-ass reality show, so he must be crazy. You know, so once I retired and really just wasn't worried about getting fined by the got NBA. Got divorced. That helped. Thank Lord. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. 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 Wait, 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 wait. I never got married, so I ain't got to worry about that. Hey, you and the family, bro. <laughs> I, I just want to tell you that you guys, you guys are your brothers, right? Brother in law? No, 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 no. I never got weird. married. Brother in law. there too. <laughs> two bad decisions. <laughs> anyway, um, you maybe forget what I was going to say. Uh, You're going, you got your own really, voice, Coach Kareem. Yeah, you got your own yeah, voice. Yeah, so it was really just to be able to show who I was. You know, I'm a, I'm a candidate advocate. I'm a father. I'm a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do a lot of charitable work. I'm doing policy in Sacramento, changing police procedure bills. So people got to see, like, okay, well, we saw a small glimpse of him, but we're really getting to see into his life now that I wasn't having to worry about any restrictions by the NBA. So it's really been a blessing for me, and, you know, my post-career has been just as exciting as my career. For you too, you obviously your reputation precedes you everywhere you go, and certainly the way you left the NBA. But I've seen you use Instagram and other social media for people to really know who you are and how smart you are about the game. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> no, okay. See, Richard, what? I'm trying. See, when when I was in, when I was in, when I was with you guys in NBA, yes. I was clean. I was because I knew you? how to manipulate. Yeah. You trying to manipulate me. I get it. You know, so, you know, I played that media game, you so did. I Absolutely. always gave the yes. right answers and all of that. That is 100% true. So once, once I got in trouble and then this was who I was, you know, I had to start realizing, like, wait, I can do 100 things right, one thing wrong, and I'm the bad guy. So I just said, fuck it. I'll just be the bad guy, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. Instead of trying to fight against being the bad guy, I'll take control of yes. the gun thing and just mm -hmm. make fun of myself. Mm -hmm. So the media couldn't do it anymore, <laughs> and that's yeah. just how. It, that's why no chill came about. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just. I'm gonna just say whatever yeah. I want to <laughs> say. Right. What's so funny is <clears throat> the post you actually do see. That is level one to the first 10 copies I was gonna post. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, they're gonna kill me for this one. Yeah. <laughs> so when you do get it and that's bad, you should just imagine what I was gonna write. <laughs> I want access to some of those other videos. But I would say that, that too, I, I think that was big too with me because like I said, I stayed in my, being the villain. You know, I faked the ball in Kobe's face in 2010, and ever since then, you're this fucking guy that did this. You know what I mean? So at first, I'm just like, man, these people, they're tripping. That's not who I really am. But man, forget it. I'm going to embrace myself. So I used to have to tell my twins, because they would travel, and I would get booed at visiting arenas. They're like, Dad, right. why, do you, why do they boo you? I was like, well, because Daddy does a good job against their best player. But then I was just like, you know, I'm kind of like the Undertaker going against Hulk Hogan. Like, mm -hmm. I'm the bad guy, but... 
they mess with me for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like I said, I just embrace that for the rest of my career. <laughs> and you guys both have a lot of fun on social. Paul, your IG <laughs> stories are fantastic every time I, I call it up. Um, what is it? How, what kind of outlet is it for you or how does it empower you? Um, just for people who just didn't know really a lot about me other than I play with Boston, which everyone hates. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, people just saw my personality on the court uh, in my interviews, but didn't really know too much about who Paul Pierce is. And, uh, you know, just give me a chance to kind of express that, you know, the things I do off the court, the fun I have, the, you know, fun guy like Kawhi Leonard, I'm a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the you first know, time I, I've ever real. heard you say, my personality is just like Kawhi Leonard. <laughs> 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 and, yeah. and so, uh, you know, it just gave people an opportunity just to kind of get to know me because, you know, the guy that you saw on the court was just my on-court personality. And the guy you see off the court is, is totally different. So uh, I get a chance to really express that. And, you know, it's helped me as far as off-the-court marketing things, branding, you know, whether I brace being a bad guy or a good guy, I'm probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> good. <laughs> I was going to ask you guys how seriously players even take NBA Twitter, because I think if you follow the NBA, there's all kinds of social. IG is really strong with NBA players, but NBA Twitter is kind of when the Rockets and Clippers secret tunnel thing happens and two in, you know, yeah. one in the morning. and every, Everyone's glued to uh, NBA Twitter uh, to try to find it. Oh, look, oh, look behind <laughs> us. We People killed me because I was trying to uh, use the emoji in the wrong way. I think right. I took a screen I of think, the yes. <laughs> and then I said that instead of just sending the emoji. Yeah. This was, of course, during the famous DeAndre Jordan is kidnapped and locked in with the Clippers, right? <laughs> and you had guys, different guys at the Clippers sending different modes of conveyance, meaning I'm going to get there, right? So guys had a car, an no, airplane. This was so cool because like, people was wondering, like everybody heard we had a flight to uh, Houston. Right. We jumped on a private, bomber's private jet, future Houston. And then they we're all in DeAndre's house. This is when we're trying to get DeAndre to sign. This is my first year with the Clippers. We're like, uh, we trapped DeAndre in. So what we did, we put a chair against the door, this took a picture, amazing. sent it off. Like we had, we're not letting lit him out his house. We got him tied to the chair. <laughs> and, and so it's like, people are like, man, what's going down? You know, is DeAndre going to Dallas right. or is he coming to the Clippers? And like, it was a rumor that Mark Cuban showed up to the house. Oh, man. It, it, this took on a, on a life of its own, and then all the players started playing into it, and it, it, it's fun for the for the fan who doesn't know. At least they feel like they're a part of the the decision making and the process of it, and you know, not kept in the dark. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about it, Richard, but you weren't even on Twitter. So, no. how seriously do NBA players take Twitter? Apparently, not very for you for a long time. I stayed away from Twitter. I didn't join Twitter till this April. I didn't join uh, Instagram till September because I just knew. I wasn't going to be able to control myself in certain moments. <laughs> and so I was like, I really don't need this at this point, Mike. So I have the smallest following probably of all the guys up here. You don't have a following because you wasn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's why. But see, the problem, is, the problem is you guys laugh at these jokes. That's the problem. Like, he's the only person up here without a championship. Like, he's the only person up here. Like, he's the only one up here. Yeah, he might be say, yeah. He's the only one left there without a ring. It's so. okay, I got you, Gil. <laughs> I forgot you was on that team with LeBron James. Like, see, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. That's, he has no following because of that. Like, that's why you don't have a following. Okay. Stop. Yeah, but I could have at least told the LeBron's followers that I had Instagram. On, dude. You're just sitting up here had, lying to these folks like, oh, I didn't get no, on Twitter. Because nobody's going to follow you. Nobody knew who you were. <laughs> so like, you were, your, your team was good Steve, in 2001 Steve, and 2002. Stop. After <laughs> that, that I'm supposed to ask you guys why NBA players are just better at social media than a lot of the other athletes in other sports. No, so this is the thing. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to be better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's, the, that's, that's my, my thing. I'm going to be better than Gilbert. <laughs> right? that's, that's the thing. Right? If I'm going to do it, I'm going to be better. But I, again, this, even the Snapchat thing, it was like the young guys on our team. It was Kyrie, Iman Shumpert at the time. They were the first ones to show me how to do it. So I just started messing around and started taking pictures and then started, you know, doing more and more. And, I, you know, just had fun with it. And then ultimately we won a championship. And so <laughs> yeah, we started building. Like the following went crazy because yes. I pretty much Snapchatted our whole championship run. You did. And, and, our, entire, and our entire parade and all uh -huh. the things that went so, on. Though, you said so half following. a decade of LeBron. I hope you can win one. I know, right? <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I only was within two years. Like five years, what I'm hoping to get one. <laughs> Why do you think, Matt, that, that NBA players... The sad players, part is I thought he was retired. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he did 
try to retire. And then they were like, how about the When money? I seen him at the parade, I was like, oh my God, please retire. It's like, you're like, like, six, like six years ago. You're like, you're like Vince Carter right now. Like, he's still there? Like, shit, I didn't know that fucking guy is still there. I thought he was, I thought he was done like 2009, bro. Are you, are you still like, 10 more years? <laughs> 10 years of this guy. It's like, Four really? points, two points, three points. <laughs> Give it up. <laughs> Give it up already! I thought y'all would. I thought y'all would see me. No, this is this is every day. This is every day. That's every day. This is every day. And it's nice because I have a couple of our producers from the jump in the audience here. We don't even have to have a show on Monday. We can just air this panel. Be fine. Matt, why do you think that? And again, maybe it's just because we get this on social media. Why do you think NBA players have been able to master social media and Twitter and Instagram in a way we've seen? Some baseball players and football players do it, but not to the degree. I, I think not to sound conceited by any, mean, by any means, but I think NBA sets trends for cultures. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When we train, I talked about this on our tunnel. Mm -hmm. tunnel yeah, you can yeah. Yeah. I hosted sure. my new show, Tunnel Takedown Complex, every Wednesday, 5 o'clock, earlier, <laughs> earlier, earlier this morning, yeah. and we had Allen Iverson. And yeah. I actually, was actually with AI when the whole process changes. You know, we went from wearing baggy clothes and 5XTs and do-rags and chains and everything to wearing, uh, you know, clothes that fit our body and suits. Mm -hmm. And then you saw the NFL do it. And then you saw rappers starting to come out mm -hmm. and do it. So I really just think the NBA kind of leads in culture. You know what I mean? And I think at the end of the day, they kind of really want to know, like Paul said earlier, who we really are. Mm -hmm. You know, they get a glimpse at us on TV, whether you like... You may not like Paul just because he played for the Celtics, but you don't know him. So this gives them a chance to get to you. may not like me because I probably slapped one of your favorite players, but then you get a chance. <laughs> you get a chance to like know the real me <laughs> off the court. You know what I mean? So I just think people are so fascinated these days about what they're really like and how mm -hmm. deep they can really get into our lives and that social media gives us a chance to do that. The downside of social media sometimes is it can burn players, and there's burner accounts that some guys oh, use. Yeah. We've had not just Kevin Durant. We had the general manager from the 76ers' That's wife right. kind of putting out a burner account with stuff and, and sort of things like that. So KD what? tweeted that from his actual person. account, but it was supposedly that he thought he was using I never knew what he his said. That's burner crazy. account. Now you know. So what he was doing <laughs> was he was using a burner account where no one knew it was him, to oh, reply yeah. to fans who would talk about, hey, how bad he or the Thunder were, right? Gilbert would still be in the league if he used a burner account and not his actual own well, account. <laughs> it's possible, you know, Gilbert, we might the, talk. The difference between NBA and everyone else is you can't suspend your best player for a season without it hurting your team. Right. So we have more leverage. More leeway, yeah. So we, have, we can express ourselves better than everyone else. So if you take someone like Joel Embiid and you put him in football, you know, he's they OBJ. They mm -hmm. tear his big ass yeah, up. You, you, you tear that guy apart because this is more about a team sport than an individual. Mm -hmm. So we're allowed to be individuals in a team sport. So what ends up happening is... Well, that's what the NBA market is. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So we're individual. So we can be an individual right? all year round when mm -hmm. football season's in. It's you're going to be a team. team. Mm -hmm. So somebody like o OBJ, where he's trying to say, look, I'm a star, mm -hmm. you look like crazy that. to the yeah. fans because when the team says, we don't mm -hmm. like this, this is, this, is, this is hurting our brand, yep. the fans turn on it. See, yep. the fans accepted NBA, NBA fans, and I mean NBA players as who we are. So mm -hmm. we get to be a little bit more crazier than everyone else. Well, so you don't have a burner account. We know that. I don't need a burner account. Yeah. No. 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 Matt? I always speak my mind, so. <laughs> and RJ yeah. just got a case. Yeah, I just so. got a account. He needs so. a burner account. <laughs> <laughs> we might need to get No, no, because we already know what he's going to say. Account. RJ is great. Say <laughs> 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 we're not, we're not, <laughs> by the way, we're not supposed to call him RJ anymore, oh, even though that's funny. what yeah, Gil and funny. I it's called him for the first funny. 10 years. Did, okay, did, you thank you. Name? What thank is you. It? What are we he came you? on TV and Richard. said that he oh, I, wants to I, I be didn't. Richard and not RJ. No, 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 no. no. I, I didn't say that. What I said is that when I was 17 years old, I went on my visit to Arizona, and Mike Bibby convinced me to go get a tattoo. At 17. That was the, like, that was the, got RJ the MB, guys, you got the yeah, MB? Yeah, you know, I didn't get Team Dime. I wasn't crazy. <laughs> right? So yeah. I get the RJ, and then all of a sudden people started calling me RJ, and I just got tired of correcting people. That was it. That's the story. But we're allowed to still call you. Y'all can say whatever the hell y'all want. I there don't care. There you go. Yeah, look at his Except face. Except for Gilbert. All right. I want, to, <laughs> I want to ask you guys about analytics, right? Because you have also uh -oh. the branch in the NBA 
of people who have come into the league. And social media, frankly, has given them an amplified voice also. You have people who are on Twitter. You have people who are on Instagram who are sort of throwing in, well, these are the percentages, and this is what's going on, and this is where guys should shoot from. And Twitter amplifies that also. Paul, what do mm -hmm. you think about the fact that we've got more of a voice there? Kevin Durant was recently tweeting with someone who uh, I believe works for a gambling website, but he's sort of their analytics guy. And they were going back and forth, and Kevin Durant goes, nobody wants to look at a graph while talking about hooping? Like, what, what, what is this? What do you think about uh, that amplification from social media? From, from analytics? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I think it plays, I, I think it plays a, a small piece uh, in the game. That was really um, him, though, right? That, that was wasn't really the bird. Same yeah. account, that was, that you was, know, really um, But yeah. the thing is, you can't measure is, you know, like, your stars. And, and you can't measure, the analytics can't measure, like, matchups. It can't measure how your star is or your players acting like the, like, last minutes of the game. When they say, like, he shoots a certain percentage from here, here, or there, there's no way, like, you're going to say, if I'm going over 15 on the game and it's, like, a minute left and I have the shot, you're still going to want me to take the shot no matter what the analytics is going to say. So um, it, it plays an important part, I think, for like role players like it's RJ. And, uh, you know what I'm saying? But like guys like me, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll be that guy today. It's fine. It's fine. No, so, no. So, today. Uh, <laughs> So I, I really think analytics came about, I think as these owners started paying more and more yeah, premiums more jobs, for these teams, yeah. Yeah. these owners, they are billionaires and they understand numbers, they understand percentages, they understand graphs. The only problem is, is that you emulate the best players, right? Whether it's Kobe Bryant, um, you know, Michael Jordan, Kevin Durant, young players. And so the whole thing is like no pull-up jumpers, it's the worst shot in basketball, it's this and that. Well, at the end of the day, too many great players have used that, but a lot of teams are trying to only a layup or only a three. So I think that's where a lot of players are like, if you have an open 15 foot shot, you gotta be able to knock it down. But there are teams now that are like telling players to not do this because mm -hmm. they're just going off analytics. But the greatest players of all time have done that. So I think that's where analytics kind of fall a little bit short when you're trying to train and teach younger players. This conversation with Kevin Durant, where you just guys just saw the tweet go up on the screen, that was actually off of a segment on the jump that we did. Uh, we did a segment about the Bulls, to Richard's point, telling some of its young players, don't shoot mid-range jumpers, ever. You should shoot a three or you should be within a few feet of the hoop. My sentence I always say is that, yes, I understand that three is more than two, but two is more than zero. So if you don't have a good three-point shot, take the two. Um, and, and this is kind of what we got onto on TV, and some of the analytics people on Twitter picked that up and started being, well, exactly, if you take this, and then you should step three steps back and this, whatever. <laughs> None of them and, play basketball. And ever, Kevin Durant ever. is the one who yeah. came in and said, hey, you know, I'm going to take the shot, and then that degenerated into the tweet that you saw <laughs> up there. But it has given those kinds of people a voice. What do you yeah. think, Matt, it's given about them the fact not that not only a voice, but jobs? Yeah, yeah. but jobs in, in, as in well. front offices, That's, jobs yeah. on on the NBA bench. They got that. Uh, that's what I was going to touch on. They got people in the front office that never dribbled a basketball or can't, you know, chew gum and walk at the same time. And it's given those type of people a, a strong voice in mm -hmm. our game. And yeah. you know, I think it. I mean, I think Richard and is the most political way about the analytics and and, and management, but. It just takes the human element out of the game. And mm -hmm. like Paul touched on it, you, you don't know, anybody can make a shot in a gym with nobody on it. But can you make a free throw with seven seconds left for the final? You know what I mean? There's so, many, there's so much of the human element that analytics doesn't touch on. Are you good under pressure? You know, some guys can't play against, you know, in the spotlight. Like coming yep. at, playing in LA is so much more than just, play, just playing mm -hmm. basketball. Yep. Can you handle that? Analytics me me doesn't measure any of that. So I just think there's so much missing. I think it plays a small part. And it gives, like I said, guys that, didn't have any chance to touch this game somehow, mm -hmm. allows them to touch the game. When you see that, because it wasn't as big a part of the game when you played it. it actually was. Yes. It, <laughs> well, <laughs> analytics started in contract negotiations. Ah. That, that's, that's where it actually started, where you have someone like, because I remember, mm -hmm. Mike Miller. Yes. Right? Yeah, you're so smart. Thank yes. you. <laughs> I know that. That's mm -hmm. why I'm up here. <laughs> wait, wait, so, wait. How did I introduce you? One of the most notorious and smartest guys I've ever To be honest, I wasn't even paying attention because I was just looking at myself. I understand. <laughs> that man's handsome up there. That's what I was really looking at. What people don't understand is like one of the most underrated qualities about him is how humble he is. Yes. Right? Like that is something you can't that, that as you long can't as you get that everywhere. how humble he is and how he approaches everything is, go ahead. So I'm Mike sorry. Miller so, should have been a darling of an analytics no, no. crowd because so, he hit threes. So what happens with contracts and you have a player like Mike Miller, right? averaging nine, 12 points a game. 
six rebounds, six assists, shooting 50%, 90%, 40%, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you get this guy paid $60 million? You use analytics. You do, oh, if he played 48 well, minutes, he mm -hmm. would average 20 points, this, this, and this, and this. So you get this average guy using analytics overpaid. And that's where agents was doing. They were using the 48-minute rule on non Talented players. Not to get talented. To, no, no, no. You knock down, like, down a three without no, a but, shoe to but help you win shoot, an NBA if you title. Shoot, if you I'm only talk. shoot one three a game, yes. only when you're open and you're shooting 60%, yeah. that's not a true statement of how good you can shoot. So when someone says, well, you only shot 32% and he shoots 70%, he's a better player. I mean, he's a better shooter. Put us both on the court. Bet some money on it. And I yeah. guarantee you, he won't even live. But if he's only shooting wide open <laughs> shots well, once yeah. a game. He takes open shots. You take horseshit shots. Yes. He shoots a better percentage. So, like, I get it. I, we get so, it. So that's how the analytics played out. So you don't really like. Right now, if you say who's the top five best shooters in the game, most of the an analytics will lose. Because you would, you would take the person who's, who looks like he's making the most. So you would take Steph. You would probably take... Clay. Are you saying Clay. Steph's not the best shooter when his hand is not broken? Uh oh. Uh -oh. You got I mean, because because I've seen him shoot, but, I wouldn't bet against Clay. Right. Oh no. Well, that's. I mean, that's a fair. I, I mean, well, you, but, you have. But the people who who focus on numbers would say both of those guys. And look, I think analytics is kind of a catch-all. It's just another piece of information. And if it was treated in the NBA as, hey, this is another piece of information. I got the piece of information like Matt's talking about. Who gets it done when there's someone in his face and the pressure's on? I know about Paul Pierce that I want him to take that last shot. We saw it in every city that he played in. If you, it's a piece of information. I have a piece of information that, like, James Harden play, knocking things down from three is going to help win me basketball games, if it was treated like that. But social media is interesting, and in this 365 NBA, it amplifies that voice the, the, and has become something that people rally the against. The one thing that I'll say is in baseball, when they had analytics and you've seen the money ball, mm -hmm. I think that's genius. It works because it's just one person versus a pitcher. <laughs> that's all it is. But when you add basketball, mm -hmm. you have to add there's a level of fatigue, there's a level of chemistry, mm -hmm. there's a level of how much people understand each other. And chemistry and hitting people in the right spots at the right times, enjoying playing with each other, playing hard, those are things that will never ever show up in analytics and I don't think gets enough credit and that's where guys that have never played basketball, they'll just, oh, well, we're gonna take this person off this right. team even though he helped keep the locker Huge. room together. Right. Right. But this person averaged this person, he shot 40%, this person shot 40%, it'll work the same. But there's a chemistry element mm -hmm. there. Don't worry, we can do therapy on your time where you left Cleveland some other time. You don't have to talk about that here. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone's just gonna shit on me today. I'm not going to. <laughs> Bro, I told you I, I like your outfit backstage. Uh, I, I fuck with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. And I will say there's no analytic for, uh, what did you call bank? No, I call game. So that's, yeah, I don't right. know what the analytics on that shot you took were, but obviously. They went in. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I do want to move on, though, to sort of that, again, 365 nature with the free agency and trades and all of that. How much do you guys follow the stuff that goes on in the off season with, all, with who's moving around and when and where and I, all the rumors leading up to it? I think I found myself post-career following it more than when I played. I didn't give a shit when I played, to be honest really? with you. You know what I mean? I wasn't paying attention. I wanted to get away from basketball. And I think post-career coming into, you know, your space and, mm -hmm. and being in this commentating space now is where you really, and it, to me, it's more exciting now and more interesting to me now. Because like mm -hmm. I said, when I played, I didn't care where nobody went. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal to me. But you're uh, someone who moved around. It wasn't yeah. something you, you tried to keep your ear to the ground on? I didn't care. My agent would have to find me wherever I was at. Like, hey, you're going here. I was like, how much? Cool. Let's go knock it out. I wasn't really tripping like that. You know what I mean? There was always just so much more for me to do. So I think post-career now is, you know, you follow everything. And it's cool. Yeah. I, I follow trades more on will that guy fit? Right. And why did you get him versus getting this player? You know, my thing has always been even a general manager and you making plays, where did you play at? Do you know no, basketball? No. <laughs> like, you know, like, do you know basketball? Do you understand that, okay, this guy's, he plays on the right block, so the guy you traded for also plays on the right block. Will they mesh? Like, I know you guys see names. So you got this name versus this name. We're going to be good. Well, if they play in the same realm, then they won't be good. Right. And, you know, some of the trades I look at, I'm like, ah, that's never going to work. Like when 
I mean, it ended up getting vetoed um, due to Lakers having too much money after the trade <laughs> was the Chris Paul trade. <laughs> when Chris Paul came, um, and on the back end, Dwight was going to come. So you had Kobe, Dwight, and Chris Paul. Mm-hmm. What ended up happening is they had too much money. They had $24 million left in cap space, which means you could have got two more max players starting at $12 million. So they could have technically got Dwayne Wade and LeBron James, and then Kobe's $23 million would have been gone. They could have signed two more max. So they would have had the Olympic team for the last 10 years. <laughs> so, but the one thing that I was curious about that trade is Chris Paul was ball dominant. Kobe's never played with a guy who was an actual point guard. Yep. His point guard was sit in the corner, like atmosphere. Like you, you're, you're <laughs> like these guys right here, just fucking cameramen. Just sit there, and when I get it to you, I get it to you. So that would have been the first time he ever played besides Gary Payton, and you see how that didn't play well. So I look at trades like that, like will that actually go together? And if you don't know basketball, why did you make that trade? And and it's more of that. How much do you follow it? Uh, I follow it quite a bit because the funny thing is when you turn on, <clears throat> when you look at it, when you ask the player, you know, um, say he gets traded, and they're like, how you find out? Was your know, agent didn't call? Did the general manager call? They look, no, I found out on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's like, I don't know if the pers- the player takes it like Did you find personal. out? On, did, did you ever find out on social media no, you got traded? No, I've never, I've never been traded in the middle of a season. Right. Um, I was traded based on like a conversation, but like yeah. when you watch it, uh, it's funny, but at least, at least you get the information pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, know you ever find saying? out so. on social media? Oh, no, Not that you were on my social basketball media. camp told me. Are you serious? Yeah. Because yeah, he was, found was, out on social media. I was signing autographs at my basketball camp. You've been and traded. It, yeah, oh yeah, and, and uh, his dad had just told him, right? His dad had just told him, so he came up and told me. And I was like, oh, because it was draft day. And so then like three minutes later, my phone rang and they said I was going to Milwaukee. Ooh. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's, my, I think it's the thought. greatest thing ever you know, now because you can like not have to be the bad guy. Like, as if I become a German manager or coach, you're not the bad guy. And then even like in a relationship, you can just like I'm, I'm done with this girl. <laughs> dude, that, that, I can break up. We can break up with a girl on Twitter now. That's yeah, crazy. Like, no. You can do it so indirectly. I'm, I'm going to sort of pull back the curtain on how that happens. The way it happens is there's there's many people involved in a trade, right? And mm-hmm. it's hard to keep a secret when there are more than two people involved, as you guys all know. And so you have both teams, front offices. You have the agents of the players involved. Somebody in that circle right. is not interested in the information staying quiet. It's not in someone's best interest mm-hmm. to keep that quiet. So somebody will leak it. And everybody else in that circle wants the information to stay quiet. They don't want a player to know that he's in a trade conversation mm-hmm. unless that trade gets done because then that player is not happy mm-hmm. afterwards. Well, that's what, so, it, that's what happened with Kyrie. That's well, why Kyrie ended up asking out of Cleveland. Right. There was a trade that was supposed to go down. Uh, and I for knew... For what? I, uh, you know the, the ins I, and I outs? I the details. Let's hear it. I mean, you're done. Who cares? Well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been reported to no, no, an it's extent, been reported, right? But basically what happened was, it, is so Josh Kroenke, the owner of the Denver Nuggets, he called me and asked me about a couple of players. Hey, what do you think? And I was like, no, that's a good deal. And so this was on the day before the draft. And I was like, no, that's a good deal. And there were, they were players moving. And so... Come to find out, he calls the owner uh, from the Indiana Pacers saying, like, hey, we're so excited. I think this is a win-win. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, I think there's some misinformation being followed. This is owner to owner having this conversation. These are and trade th- this is trade discussions. And again, this has been right, reported. Right, this yeah. is Paul George, Kyrie Irving possibilities moving around with Denver's at 13. Exactly. So all of a sudden, the, the owner is like, what, what do you mean? This is what has been told to my general manager. And then once that was found out by Kyrie, he was like, wait a second. If you guys are trying to trade me, if you guys are shopping me, then I want out. I don't care that it fell through. I don't care. Like, I want out. And that's fair for Kyrie to say that. To know that the team that he was drafted by, won a championship for, did all these things, wanted him or was shopping him, then all of a sudden they made a decision that he wanted to go out, and that's how he ended up in Boston and ultimately uh, Brooklyn. But, yeah. So it's because that can happen that other teams generally don't want guys to know, right? Yeah. You know that you know that you were in a trade rumor for something or someone else was? No, they wasn't trading me. No, yeah. they, I was too talented. They, they could yes. not trade that contract. <laughs> I was too talented. They couldn't trade me. The contract was to me. They were like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Untradeable contract. Hey, hey. In history. <laughs> Y'all hear this, right? Un- untradeable contract. Yes. Mm-hmm. That, that's not a good. We're not saying it in a good way. Hint, hint, <laughs> hence why I pulled a gun on my teammates. Right. Came out right. <laughs> <laughs> we can't trade, and we'll damage him. Exactly. Ah, ah. Now you got smart. Finally, 
Do you, you got smart? Do you, you don't. Do you? But but like, wait. I want to go back this, and and, and we, I'm not trying to go in a dark place. But given the person <laughs> that you pulled a gun on, and now knowing his see, future there history, you go. I never content. touched a gun ever in my life. Okay. okay, that's a lie. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait. No, no, that's a lie. I can't I, speak I, for Madam Hall, but you have two people up wait, here who know that. No, I don't mind. I don't mind. I love it. Let me tell this story. So we're in college, right? So I'm, we're, going, we're going to Best Buy. Uh, I'm going to Best Buy. It's like, you know, Tuesday night. I'm trying to get me, like, the, the new NBA Live or something. So I go in there. I see Gilbert. I'm like, Gilbert, what you doing? We're leaving Walmart. He was like, oh, I'm just getting some more bullets for my gun. And I was like, what? I'm like, I'm like, what? And then he goes, yeah. And he opens his trunk up, and he's got a rifle there, and he's got a thing full of bullets. And I was like, all right, well, man, you have a good night. I'm like, oh. It's a shame that was before it's you were. Come on. Nice. But I was like, so then when I found out that he was bringing bu- guns to, to the arena, I was like, this sounds about right. Paul, do you worry, as we've gotten into the machine, this summer 40% of NBA players sign new contracts. This summer, so many of them because they changed teams. And the interest in the off-season moves is so crazy. Do you ever worry it's going to overtake the interest of the play on the court? Or do you think it's a fun part of the game? It's a like? fun part of the game. I mean, people like the player movement because, for one, one player can change a franchise fortune. I mm-hmm. mean, we saw that happen with Toronto. That's yep. the beauty about the NBA and any, any other sports. Like, you can trade a quarterback, a hockey player, baseball, but one player, you move one player and it just says, okay, they're a championship team. Like, you're saying that now that Kawhi is in... The Clippers, Clippers, right? or like when he was in uh, Toronto. So that's the beauty of now. And then we're going, we're going to see it in a couple years when Greek Freak, when he goes to another team, it's going to go. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! He go I mean, I, if he goes to another team. Breaking news. Uh, yeah. yeah. We got the Black Wolves. We got the Black Wolves. He's not going to sit it for long. We, we, we get it. I mean, he's going, he's going, he's going, he's going, he's going, he's going to Boston. But anyway. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh. Keep that quiet. <laughs> it's between Just, the no, world. Between the world. Keep in this room. It's being broadcast on Turn the, the internet, off. but it's fine. No, I mean, yeah. that's, the, that's the beauty of it. I mean, everybody <laughs> likes to play our movement because now... Uh, it doesn't keep one team in a small market in the dirt for so many years. Now you got smaller market teams who are good, like Milwaukee, Toronto's, and all that. It's, and people always talk about this big market thing, and it's not even about that anymore because, or New York, New York's been, New York Knicks have been bad for yeah, a long, long time. Oh, they're supposed to be like, they're supposed to be like the biggest market. And it's like nobody ever wants to go there. So the beauty about <laughs> just the player movement, I think, is exciting for the fans, excited for, for us just to like, and then the fans can purchase all these new jerseys. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like this right? one. It's, it's good building. for merch. It's good for merch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that's the sole reason why the NBA is 365 now mm-hmm. is because the movement people look forward is the second the finals are okay. Where's so and so going? Happen, it's it's right. the next move. You know what I mean? And then right, th- right after that, the season starts. You know, so it's almost that we. With all due respect to other sports, we dominate headlines. I mean, I remember we're you know we're breaking news yes. during important NFL no, stuff. NBA and, shows are getting better ratings in July yeah. than when even though NFL's back in camp and right. training camp yeah. because people yeah. are moving around, mm-hmm. um, and, and that does yeah. get so wow. much attention. Um, we've seen it's funny this season we saw Jalen Ramsey yeah. ask for a trade, and as soon as that happened, there was the NBAization of the NFL. <laughs> that was all those headlines about that. Do you think that the NBA, in that nature of, hey, we, this is now dominating year-round, the took, NBA took all those headlines away from the Super Bowl, remember, leading up mm-hmm. to Super Bowl week, trade deadline happened in the NBA and all this crazy stuff was going on. Do you think that the NBA is chipping away either at the NFL's popularity or just changing the NFL and sort of the character of the NFL? Well, not, not. Watch this next question. <laughs> no, it is. Not really. No, it is, though, Gil, because, for one, the reason why it is, is because we're sending our teams over to other, other countries. countries. We have more international players. Mm-hmm. And so, and then we are playing against other international teams. And so now that popular, that makes it more popular to other international cultures to where- Bigger markets. Take, that, 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 there are bigger markets than the United States. That mean that you can market to. For popularity, so, yes, but you gotta remember our arena is still 20,000. Right. You know, compared to well, football it's, it's more It's more of like TV revenue. It'll be the it's TV the revenue. TV the TV sales. revenue. When you have China, when you have an owner from China, when you have an India. owner from India, mm-hmm. when you have, you know, the MVP from Greece, when you have the most valuable player from Africa, when you have the Rookie of the Year from Europe, when you have this, yeah. it's just going to continue to grow and build these fans. And we saw, we talked about it with the Dream Team, mm-hmm. right? The Dream Team helped grow the, the, the global game. 
And now these individual players are going to continue to grow their game in their individual spaces. And then ultimately, I, I don't think it'll ever, in my opinion, pass soccer because soccer is just it is the number yeah. one sport in the world. Uh, but it is it, it can be on par with globally like those two sports are the number one things because anyone can play basketball. You need a hoop. Like there's people that don't even have shoes that can play basketball. Right. You don't need anything but just a basketball and a hoop and you can and you can go. And also you can access it from any place now at any time. It doesn't have to be basketball season and you don't have to live near an arena. If you are a Gilbert Arenas fan and you live in the deepest, darkest corners of I don't know, where is there yeah, deep, that's where it's oh, where yeah, where that's where 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 you see it on social, and you can connect with him in that place. And that is what I think is changing the popularity of the sport. I really appreciate you guys all being here today. Now you know what it's like for me on the jump after the cameras go down. We hear these stories.